I want to share with you a story, and, and sometimes, just being honest with you, I feel like sometimes I tell a lot of stories, and I wonder sometimes if they get boring. And so we got two avenues. You, you guys get to choose today by popular, uh, popular approval or disapproval of whether I'm going to include the camping story that goes with the message or exclude the camping story. So as some of you go, oh gosh, not another camping story, but that's how God talks to me. When I go out in the woods, it's, he, it's where I, you know, Moses went to the mountain and to the tent and I'd go to the woods. And so, you know, uh, is anybody, let me see, I'll do it this way. Is it okay if I include the short? Is that okay? All right, good. That's really good because we would be out of here in like five minutes if you didn't say that. So I'm very, very happy that you approve, and I will try to, try to keep it somewhat short. Well, let's pray first, and then we want to get into what it is that God would have us to share this morning. Lord, I thank you, God, most of all for your Son and your salvation. God, you are so gracious to us that we, while we were at our worst, God, not our best, you came, and you made a way for us to be in relationship with you. And so thank you, Father, for what you've done. Lord, I pray that you'll set in our hearts today... Uh, your agenda, your spirit, and your word. Lord, help it to guide us and lead us down the path that you want us to go on. We'll trust you to do it, and we'll trust you that you're going to help us to enjoy it every step of the way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I really don't know where to start uh, with the story or with the scripture, so we'll just kind of go with it. But uh, I'll start with the story. About 10 years ago, I was uh, working at this church as the youth pastor, and I'll say I'm going to leave out a lot of names because a couple of the people that were involved in this story are around and some not, but, uh, but some will chuckle and you'll probably realize that they were either uh, culprits in the story or at least witnesses to it. Uh, we went on a camping trip as a youth group, uh, like we often did, and my youngest son, Christopher, was seven, eight, something like that. A uh, very small, small kid, but uh, we wanted to bring him because he gets, used to get mad at us when we would go camping with the big kids, he called them, and so he was sort of the little mascot at the time, and we brought him along, and he had a big old time hanging out with us, and, and we went to a national forest that is called Uari. It's spelled Uhari, but every time I say that, they correct me out there. Uh, apparently, the H is silent. So it's Uari National Forest. Now, Uari National Forest, if you've never been there, is, uh, as scientists call it, one of the oldest mountain ranges. So it's kind of hilly, but it's worn out. But there's a lot of really cool rock outcroppings and stuff like that. Very cool place, very large place, like 50,000 acres, very rugged. It's not developed in really at all. A couple small places. But it's one of those places that is, is really uh, very wildernessy. And I've told you one story I remember about going out there before where I got really, really lost. I had my wife and one of, one of our friends with us, and they lost all faith in my navigational abilities on that trip. Uh, and, and so it's easy to get turned around. It's easy to get confused out there, for me anyway. And so we were walking, and we were going down a uh, familiar path, but very, apparently not very well known. As a group, there's about 35 kids and, and about three leaders, my, well, four leaders, my wife, me, uh, another lady, and, and uh, Diedrich, who sings right up here, uh, his, his son, uh, Diedrich Jr., or D2, as we called him. We were all walking, and, and as you can imagine, you've got this group. And, you know, really, if you take a group of 35 teenagers and you get them together and you take them to the woods, you get a full spectrum of the entire human persona. Believe it or not, you got your alpha males and females, and you got your stragglers, and you got your self-doubters, and you got your people that just, you know, get along and go along and all that stuff, and everybody's doing their thing, and so we say we're going to this place we called Big Rocks, and it was, and it was, a, it's a fairly easy path because it's, it's a path, you know, when, when, let me explain Yuhari to you best way I can, uh, one of the big things that goes on in Uari every year is they have a Bigfoot hunt, a Sasquatch hunt, because they think he lives there. And I, t I mentioned this one time years and years ago, pa in passing, in a, in a sermon, and a lady, you know, seasoned lady, she's not an old lady by any means, but you wouldn't pick this lady of a, out of a crowd and go, you're a, you're a Bigfoot nut. Man, she hit me after service. She said, you believe in him too, don't you? I'm like, 
I don't, is this a trick? Right? I'm mean, like, are you going to tell anybody? You know, going around and around. And this lady, she brought me pictures. She had been out there for the hunt. You go out at night in the woods. It's crazy. Big time. I'm going to go one day. But not that I believe in them. It just aggravates the, the mess out of my wife that I act like I do. And she just makes it th- makes, thinks it makes me look dumb. And that's good. So, uh, so anyway, uh, if Bigfoot is alive, he probably lives in Uari. Just to give you an idea of what the place is like. Very, you know, isolated, very woodsy, very rugged. And so 30 of us go down this path that's well marked. We're walking along. And, and remember, I told you, you've got, you've got your kids in the group that they're hard chargers. You know, it is not about stopping to smell in the roses. It's about conquering the mission. And so they're off and they're, they got people going with them. And, and so we're thinking, well, well, I'll walk slow. I'll kind of stay in the back. And that way no one falls behind. And when we get there, we'll all be there. Only when we got there, we weren't all there. It was just me and the slow pokes and my wife and D2. And I thought, where's the rest of them? And then I thought, where's my son? My seven-year-old son, where's he? And I thought at the moment that it's probably my wife's fault that we don't know where he is. So I turned to her, where's our son? And she looks at me, and I look at her, and all of a sudden, in my mind, I could picture the whole thing. The search crews, the volunteers, the grids, you know, I'm thinking, oh, no, what in the world have we done, you know? So we leave one leader and say, you guys stay here, we're going to go, and we're going to figure out where they went. Well, the path only goes two ways, so uh, Diedrich and I ran down one way. It's a short path. We knew where that went to the lake. Nobody's there, so we go back. We head back the other way, and we began to, to, to go from a from a fast walk going, uh, wow, what are they thinking? You know, this, that, and the other two. We don't see anything. We don't hear anything. We can't hear. Because you think this is a group of about 10, 10 um, teenagers, and you'd think you'd hear them. Didn't hear a thing. So we began to move from a walk to a jog, sometimes a run, knowing that we have to catch up with them. And I thought, well, you know, I'm trying to talk myself into this isn't as bad as it feels. And... We come up to a place where the, the trail heads up to a, a kind of a hill, and we make it up to the top of the hill, and my heart just sinks because off of that hill, there are about seven or eight trails clear that go in all different directions. And I looked at Diedrich, and I don't, know how it, I don't know how I did, but I looked at my wife. Somehow she kept up with us, and she's not a runner. But moms know she probably flew <laughs> behind us because there's a baby lost, right? And we're thinking, what are we going to do? So we call out, no answer, call out, no answer. I'm thinking, man, this is bad. Diedrich, after walking around a little bit, believe it or not, sees somehow in all this, because it's not really like soft dirt. It's a lot of hard clay and, you know, rubbish. He picks out a little footprint about that big on one of the trails. And I thought, well, okay. So we start to go. Now my heart's pumping. Right? Now I'm beginning to wonder. Now it hits me. My son is lost. He might, and he might not be with the other ones. I don't know. I love teenagers, but I don't have a whole lot of faith in them to realize they've got a seven-year-old tagging behind them, you know? So I'm looking for the group, but I'm wondering if he is too. It's hard. And I start thinking about it. And I go, man, what if it gets dark? It's fall. It gets cold. It gets down to the 40s at night out there. What if he's all alone? What if he's scared? All the while I'm running, hopeful, but real nervous. And eventually, as if nothing was ever wrong, 
uh, up the path that we're running down comes a herd of about 10 teenagers. Joyous, happy, having a great time out in the woods. And I, there must have been a look on me that they'd never seen before because they stopped in their tracks. And I didn't even have words. I, I, I was mad. And I saw that, fortunately, in this pack of young, testosterone-driven alpha males, there was an alpha female who had on her shoulders my seven-year-old son. Yeah, it's good. So I was mad. I yelled something at him. You'll have to ask them. I don't think there were any explicatives or anything like that, but it was a lot of just volume getting out of me, whatever was, whatever was welling up within me. And I thought, man, this can't happen. I'm a horrible parent. But by the time we met up with the group, we had cooled off. Joy had replaced my anger. I was happy. Everything's working out fine. We're going to get to roast hot dogs and do all that fun camp stuff, get it back on with our youth weekend instead of spending it uh, a part of a search party looking for a little boy that's lost in the woods. And so as always, when I get back, I start thinking, and God starts talking. He starts explaining things to me through things that happen in the woods. And I'll share with you a scripture this morning, and I hope I can tie this together somewhat well. Luke chapter 15, verse 1, says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them a story. If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave? the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. So the Lord begins to show me through my own experience the heart of our Father. See, now's where I need that box of Kleenex. Could you hand me some, please? Let me get myself together and we'll talk, all right? God began to show me that that feeling that I was feeling, wondering where he was, knowing not necessarily that I might not find him. I didn't feel like I wouldn't find him. The question was, is what is he going to have to go through between now and the time I find him? Is he going to have to spend a night in the woods, in the cold. And I'm, I'm talking about the woods now. I'm not talking about the woods in the back of your house. This is deep woods. This is Sasquatch might pick him up and carry him off woods, right? <laughs> so we're not talking, you know, a wooded area. I'm talking deep in the woods. Rocky, crevices, you know, all that stuff. And I begin to wonder, what is he going to have to go through before I find him? And what if I don't find him? And what if, and what if, and what if? And God showed me through that 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 is a hint of what our God feels when he sees you and I wandering off from our Father, right? But think about this. Think about the parallel. My son didn't even intend to wander off from us. He was just following whatever. He was following a pack of teenagers who didn't mean bad, they didn't kidnap him. They weren't running away to hide him in the woods and take him away from me. And he wasn't running away from me. He was just going along, not really paying attention. And all of a sudden, 
he finds himself with a group of people. Guess what? He didn't even know he was lost. He had no idea he was lost until me and his mother told him we were so happy we found him. He didn't know. It wasn't even in his mind. He had no idea what, what danger was out there for him and what could have happened to him. He wasn't thinking that. And I think a lot of times when we think about people, we like to categorize people good and bad. There's the saved and there's the lost and there's the, you know, the, the good and the wicked and all this stuff. And we like to rack and stack everybody. But one thing that we forget a lot of times is that, is that people that are lost, in other words, people that are not saved, they don't know Jesus, uh, they sometimes don't even know what they don't know. And our Father's heart is breaking. Searching. And I realized, yeah, we were running those paths, but, you know, God's Spirit runs the paths. He's pursuing. He's looking, searching, calling, going after the little ones. The little ones might be 80 years old in this case. They might be 8 years old. They might be 18. And God's calling out to us to have the heart of the Father. To realize that, that when we can't get into a comfortable place where we go, oh, uh, uh, all, the, all the saved people are good and all the unsaved people are bad. That's not true. We're all bad. We're just alive and they're not. We're just safe and they're not and so for us to realize listen this is all about what's after the why have you ever thought about why we go to church or, or better yet why even this church why does this church why is it here you don't know there's like six or eight hundred churches in goldsboro i've asked myself why the lord save me why is it here there's enough churches but why here? And the why is because God loves people. The why is the fact that he said, listen, I saved you. Now, here's the deal. And this is, on another note, really the mission and the existence, the reason why the Lord's table exists. And that's go and make disciples. Baptize them. And teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Go and make disciples. That's kind of fancy talk for go and find the lost little ones out there. Show them that I'm real and that I'm alive and that I care about them. And I want to take them from being lost and in danger to being safe and secure in me. And so we have to ask ourselves yeah, it's great that I'm, it's great that I'm found. It's great that I'm safe. But what about, what about the little Chris's that are out there? My little son. Running around in the woods. Running after something he don't even, he doesn't understand. He just thought the big kids were cool. The big kids weren't bad in this case. They were being kids. He wasn't bad following them. He was just following people. And as I, I began to like just really just soak in what God was saying about this, and, 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 it, and it is a beautiful, really, a picture of how life really kind of works anyway. You notice, what, or I'll, I'll fill you in on the, the rest. I think in one of my, part of my tirade when I ran up on that crowd coming back was somewhere in that, some form of the statement, what are you doing, Right? Why did you leave the group? And their answer was, we were going to the waterfall. And I looked at them and I said, huh? Waterfall. Yeah, the waterfall. And I looked at my wife, and I looked at Diedrich, and I looked at them, and I said, there's no waterfalls here. And they looked at me and they go, yeah, we know. thinking, what in the world? I had taken some of these kids on another 
camping trip to another forest a long way away from this forest and they saw a waterfall and just being in the woods took them back and they thought yeah surely the waterfall is yeah we've been here before and they took off and they were going for the waterfall and it would be easy for us to sit back and laugh and go, you stupid, you're going after something that isn't even there. And that's really what a lot of people are doing. A lot of people who are lost, a lot of people who are going and going, they're going and they're searching for something that's not there. And a lot of people are following them and everybody's confused. And really, no one is worse. I love what you said. No one is worse than the person to their left or to their right. It's just a question of who knows where they're going. And the beauty of it is, is that just like we were searching for our son, God's always searching for his children. God's always running about, looking, watching. His spirit is chasing and drawing and drawing and trying to find out, uh, hey, where are you going? Well, I'm trying to find riches. There's not enough. I'm trying to find happiness. You won't find it. It's not in this forest. And we're all running around and we're trying to find this and we're trying to find that and we're following this person and we're following that crowd. And the bottom line is, is if we can just stop and listen and, and wait, we'll realize that God's spirit is still calling. He's still yelling to you and me. He's still yelling to all the people who are lost, who are searching, who need him who need safety, they need security, they need a father to watch over them, and they're out there, and they're not bad people, they're God's created little ones who he is concerned about, who Jesus said he came for, died for, sacrificed himself for, and we have to realize that, that God's heart is no different than a father's heart, a good father's heart. If me being as messed up as I am can be that worried and that heartbroken over my son being lost, not even that far away, how much more is God just heartbroken over the fact that, that his little ones are out there and they're lost and it's going to be cold tonight and it's dangerous out there in the dark. And we got to realize that God's invited us into this beautiful part of the plan. We ran across along the way some horseback riders. And so we stopped. And I would have asked the question, but I had no air left in my lungs because I was running. And you all know I hate running. I hope you know. If you see me running, run with me because I'm running away from something, right? I don't run for fun. There's something wrong if I'm running. But Diedrich was young and strong, and he said, have you seen a bunch of kids that look like they don't know where they're going? And they're like, <laughs> you know? And for us, you know, we're, we're a part of the plan because we're the ones who see the lost people, you know? And it's our job to really let them know that they have a, a father that's looking for them. They have a God that cares about them. So it's not about how much good or bad you've done. It's not about how, how, uh, how good or bad of a person you are. It's not about whether you've gone too far or whether you haven't, uh, haven't trusted God enough. All that stuff, listen, it wouldn't have mattered what happened that day. I was happy when I found him. I was happy when I found them. And I knew the big ones would be okay. But I was concerned about the little one that was helpless and maybe by himself. And so, my encouragement to you today is to just think about the lost people in your life. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you this, you're not going to get a lot of this permission from a lot of pastors, but if you don't have any lost people in your life, then do like Jesus did and start hanging around some Pharisees. And start hanging around some sinners. They said he hung around notorious sinners. 
Because Jesus didn't do nothing halfway, did he? So tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. So if you don't know anybody that's lost, go find some lost people. Go hang out where lost people hang out. Don't worry about it. Find them and let them know, hey, kid, your father's looking for you. I wasn't judging. I wasn't mad. I wasn't ready to kill anybody, right? I mean, afterwards, I thought about it, but <laughs> at the moment, there was this overwhelming joy. And here's the last part of my story. I would have ran until I had no skin left on my feet that day. I'd have combed every 50,000 of them acres until I found them. And I'm a messed up human father. The good thing is, is God doesn't have to run one path. God sees you. He knows where you're at. God knows exactly where everybody is. And, and the question is, 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 is whether we're willing to, to be the voice that says, listen, you don't know what you don't know. There's no waterfall here. But what there is, is a father, a good one, that knows where the waterfall is, that made the waterfall, that can bring you into everything that you've ever wanted to see, but you've got to get with him first. Amen? He knows. He knows. And so for us, it's, it is just important for us to be caught up in what God calls us to do. He says, go. Go and make disciples. Go and find them and teach them to follow me. Because when they follow me, they'll find whatever it is they're looking for. When they follow me, they won't be out there in the dark. When they follow me, they won't be lost in the woods. They won't be lost in the city or even in their own home. They'll be found. They'll be mine. And they'll be safe and secure. So let's hear the Father's heart today. Let's listen to what he's saying. And let's approach our friends who don't know Christ yet. Let's not look down on them. Let's don't look judging on them. Because half the time, they don't even know that they're not found yet. I didn't. I had to learn that I was lost. Amen? I never knew I was lost when I was lost. Had no idea. But man, when I was found, I sure knew that someone found me. That God loved me. And he was, I was safe and secure with him. Amen? Let's be a church. Let's be people who love people enough to point them to the Father that's looking for them with every bit of grace and every bit of love and compassion that we can, that we can find in Christ. Let's reach out to the people around us. You know, some of them are going to tell you, I ain't lost. That's okay. Love them anyway. Some of them are going to tell you to get lost. And you can smile and say, well, I can't really. But I'll leave you alone. But at least let's just say, hey, I saw your father up the path. He's chasing you, misses you, loves you. Would you stand with me? If you're here this morning, you might say, hey, I'm lost. I've never accepted Jesus or maybe I even knew about Jesus but didn't really understand how he viewed me and you want to be found you want to know that you're secure that you're safe in the arms of a father that will never fail you then I would ask you to do this one thing that that I'm getting ready to pray a prayer with you. But that you would acknowledge what's already in your heart. Salvation doesn't happen because you pray a prayer. Salvation happens when you, when you just surrender to that, that Holy Spirit that is calling you out already. See, the Holy Spirit has never stopped doing His work. He's never stopped drawing men and women, and young men and women, and old men and women. 
So it's our job to help them finish, get across the finish line. If you're here this morning and you want to be saved, pray this prayer out loud after me if you would. Father, I have sinned. I've made my mistakes. Sometimes I didn't even know I was lost. But I believe that Jesus came and he died for me. I believe that that blood that was shed covers my sins. I believe that you love me and you want to bring me safely into your family. I confess that Jesus is my Lord, that I'll trust him, that I'll be a disciple, that I'll follow him. Teach me. Teach me how to be the son that you know I can be, the daughter I know I can be. Fill me with your spirit, I ask. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer here or if you prayed it online, on that gray card that's in the seat backs and there's a link on there that says connection card online. If you prayed that prayer, we want to know that you prayed it because we want to come alongside you. You're never alone in this. You're always welcomed into the family of God. And we want to celebrate with you. I'm going to read the scripture to you, especially if you're the one who prayed this prayer this morning. Jesus goes on to explain. He says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she'll call in her friends and her neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. Jesus says this. He says, In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels, even when one sinner repents. When one person comes home, the angels erupt in a party. When one person says, Jesus, I want to come back to you, there's a celebration. And so you can celebrate today. We can celebrate today because we have a Father who so loves and so cares about us that he would search and search and search and come to us tenderly and invite us into, back into his family, back into his presence. I pray that you experience that presence all week this week, that it will be just sweet to you to realize that God has brought you safely into his son Jesus. Father, I pray that you'll bless your people. Father, I pray, God, that you would give them a sense and a knowing of your call on their life, God, and the invitation that they have to bring others back home. God, I pray you'll give us a heart for those people who, who are lost, who just don't know you. They're not bad, they're just lost. So Father, help us to be your hands and feet, your voice and your heart to our friends, our family, and our neighbors, everywhere we go. Give each and every person that special anointing to call each and every person they know back to a God who loves them. I pray that would be evidenced in their life this week and that you'll bless them just with a special touch as they go today. Thank you, Father, for your presence this morning. We ask, we believe all these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here.